Good morning. It's good to see you again. Why don't we begin by praying? Heavenly Father, we look for your help here as we handle your word, as we look to see uh, the beauty of the work of your son, Jesus Christ, uh, his shedding of blood, his death for the likes of us, the sinners. And Father, we pray that we see this out of the, the book of Genesis. Father, we just pray that you'd open up our ears and our eyes and our understanding so that we may be, may be able to be, with behold, that we may be able to behold the things which you have hidden in your word and some things which you've made very obvious. We ask these things, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Well, I, I trust you've read Genesis chapter 4, uh, verses 1 through 15, if you've already got the notice to read it. And if you haven't got the notice to read it, I encourage you to just put the recording on pause and read Genesis chapter 4. Okay, at least, the you know, read verses 1 through 16. We won't be covering the entire chapter, but we'll be using certain texts out of the chapter to help us along. I'm going to begin with verse 1. Uh, it reads, The man was intimate with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to, a, to Cain. She said, I have had a male child with the Lord's help. As you know, multitudes of children's books have been written and published about Adam and Eve and the garden and, and Cain and Abel. Uh, and oftentimes, books do us a disservice. They they don't always try to fill in, you might say, the blanks which are there, but just not so obvious. And so we have this picture given to us of, you might say, someone's idea of what happened in the garden and believing themselves to be drawing upon the Bible for the storyline. Uh, well, sometimes it could go awfully wrong. Let me give you an example of how our little gray cells keep images that have been, you might say, imprinted upon our minds because of, you know, media, print media, video, whatever. Uh, I'm sure many of you have watched the, the movie, The Ten Commandments about Moses and the people of Israel. Uh, you, did you check up on it as, as you're watching it, if you did watch it? You know, N Moses didn't have a girlfriend in Egypt. <laughs> he, he didn't get married till much later in life. And, you know, but somehow or another, a lot of people walk away saying, well, that's gospel truth. It isn't. It's a lie. And, uh, you know, we can infer things from Scripture. We can certainly do that. We have to be very careful that we keep within the parameters that the Scriptures themselves have set. So words are powerful. They're powerful tools for teaching. And they, they're good for teaching error and for truth. Uh, we've all seen different word pictures at one time or another drawn from the Bible. But let's hope and pray we could keep it close to the text today. Uh, it says Adam and Eve are they're pictured with just two sons initially. That's what we read about Cain and Abel. Okay, One son killed the other son and left Adam and Eve with only one bad son, Cain. <laughs> because of his sin and rebellion, Cain was mocked by God. I would call it the mock of the beast in the Old Testament, but don't run too far with that one, okay? In Genesis chapter 4, verse 15, it reads, so that whoever found him would not kill him after God put that mark on him. So it was a warning, don't kill him, okay? It's a caution, don't kill him. Don't kill Cain. But a uh, few even mention the whoever in verse 15, okay? And this question has often popped up. Did Adam and Eve have other children, okay? Uh, this is what we do know. Adam was around 130 years old when Seth was born. I don't know about you, but I think it's good that young parents have young children because when you get, when you get old and up in years, you want, you want all your children to be grown and up in years themselves before they start having children. But the bottom line is uh, it's a lot easier to have children when you're young. But Adam and Eve, uh, they didn't age as we do today because of the lack of diseases, so forth, so on. They lived longer lives, okay? They didn't have COVID around then or the flu even, okay? Maybe not even a common cold, okay? So, but there were no children born to Adam and Eve before the fall, 
before they fell, before they were put out of the garden. But many children were born to them after the fall. Where do we see that? We see this in Genesis chapter 5, verse 4. It reads, Adam lived 800 years after he fathered Seth, and he fathered other sons and daughters. Not after the 800 years, but during that 800-year period of his lifetime. Okay. Moving on to verse 2. It says, she, that is Eve, also gave birth to his brother Abel. Cain has a brother named Abel. Now Abel became a shepherd of flocks, but Cain worked the ground. Sometimes when moms and dads have children, they hope the best for their children and that their children will make them proud. Uh, Eve had very high expectations of Cain as her firstborn. It says in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, she conceived and gave birth to Cain. She said, I have a, ha, I've had a, a male child with the Lord's help. Now, Eve assumed, if you know the storyline, that the promised seed would be Cain. So she was very, very wrong. And the promised seed wasn't Abel either. Okay. So uh, who does the Holy Spirit of God tell us about? So why does the Holy Spirit, excuse me, tell us about Cain and Abel? Well, there's something to this story much deeper than most people see at first. It's simply because he has singled out these two sons, Cain and Abel, okay, to teach us a very, very important lesson about salvation and redemption by blood and to condemn salvation by works, okay? How important is salvation by blood? Well, the blood of sacrificed animals gave man a picture of the salvation which only God could give, which he would give, in Christ Jesus, his son. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22 reads, according to the law, that is Israel's law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now he's not talking about human blood. Human blood contaminates. We'll see that. Anyone as the study of, of Leviticus will see that human blood, you, you just don't touch it. It's, you know, you're unclean, okay? But the blood of God, the blood of Jesus cleanses, cleanses us of all of our sins. Okay, uh, The picture here would be fulfilled by no less than God. We see in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, it reads, Peter writes, For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your ancestors, that's Adam and Eve, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. The Messiah, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. That's Jesus, okay? With Abel, we're going to learn about how to please God, okay? He's a good example of faith in God's promise. And here again is the promise that was given to his parents. In Genesis 3, verse 15, it reads, I will put hostility between you and the woman. He's speaking to the promise. He's basically addressing this to Satan, but the promise is involved here. Uh, I will put hostility between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head, and you he will strike his heel. Who is this who? Okay, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21, it says, The Lord God made skins, clothing made from skins, for the man and his wife, and he clothed them. Now, in the course of time, Cain presented some of the land's produce as an offering to the Lord. That's verse 3. Okay. Here we see that they're, you know, in the beginning develop here, that there are only two true, only, excuse me, only two religions uh, that have been, you might say, throughout the course of man's history. It's the religion of grace, and it's the religion of works. Everyone who attempts to come to God must choose either God's grace or their own inferior works. I'm going to do it my way. Romans chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, it reads, Now to the one who works, pay is not credited as a gift, but as something owed. But to the one who does not work, that, uh, but to the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Okay? In Romans chapter 11, verse 6, Paul again writes, Now if by grace 
then it is not by works. Otherwise, grace ceases to be grace. Do you get that? The way of Abel is the way of faith in God and depends upon God's grace alone. Okay? And he, he, by offering a blood sacrifice, he basically has drawn a picture for others as well as for himself in remembrance of what God promised, that he will provide a sacrifice. God will provide a sacrifice. The way of Cain is the way of self and works. So the way of Cain is just the opposite. It's the way of self and works. Uh, his is the way to displease God. Okay, Here we have to make the assumption that both men were taught about, about their parents' fall in the garden and how God, in mercy, promised to them he would provide a savior through the seed of the woman. We've read that. God had instructed Adam as to how he was to worship and approach the living God. Adam, in turn had taught his sons, we have to assume this because they're bringing sacrifices, okay? Both Cain and Abel are bringing sacrifices, okay? They both recognize there is a God. Neither one of them is an atheist, although Cain's God may be himself. There's always that possibility. But he, they taught their sons and daughters as Abraham later on would teach his son Isaac as well, okay? We see that in Genesis chapter 22, verses 13 to 14. Genesis, uh, Abraham, the first uh, one, recognizes the father of faith. Not that others didn't have faith before. They certainly did, true believers. Genesis 22, verses 13 to 14. It reads, Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. As Abraham went and took the ram and offered it as a burnt offering in place of his son, and Abraham named that place, the Lord will provide. So today it is said, it will be provided, provided on the Lord's mountain. Okay, moving on to verses four and five here. And Abel also presented an offering, some of the firstborn of his flock and their fat portions. If you go through scripture, you're going to see that God loves the fat. Okay, fat has been demonized today. But the fat is good, and God knows it, okay? The Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but he did not have regard for Cain and his offering. Cain was furious when God did not accept his offering, and he looked despondent. It's interesting the word says this. He got depressed about the thing, okay? My offering isn't good enough. Perhaps that's what triggered it. I don't know. What was wrong with Cain's sacrifice? Okay, well, Cain and Abel, as heads of their families, brought their sacrifices and offerings to God. Okay, Cain brought the fruits of the ground, which he had raised, but Abel brought a lamb that would be sacrificed, whose blood would be shed. Okay, Cain, through his offering, denied his need of the Redeemer, the Messiah, whom God had promised his parents. Okay. It was a bloodless and faithless offering. He set himself up as his own priest, his own mediator, and his own intercessor. His bloodless sacrifice denied that he was a, a sinner before God. I'm all right. My sacrifice is okay. He deserved condemnation and death. Uh, nothing innocent had died to provide him with a covering. Nothing. Nothing. Not those vegetables, that's for sure. In Hebrews chapter 9, verses 22 and 23, it says, the writer of Hebrews writes, According to the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens, that's you and me, to be uh, the copies in the heavens, uh, the yeah, copies of the things and forgive me for the copies of the things in the heavens to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves to be purified with better sacrifices than these. Oh, excuse me. So how do we get this right? Okay, let me read it again first, uh, all over again. Verse twenty-three. It was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be purified with these sacrifices. So those are the, my correction here is that the sacrifices which the Jews brought. Okay, those were copies of the ones that would, you know, the real things in heaven. Okay, uh, 
but the heavenly things themselves to be purified with better sacrifices than these. Christ is the ultimate sacrifice. He has pure, purified us. He has washed us clean of all of our sins, past sins, present sins, and future sins. He's made us righteous. Why? Because we believe by faith in what he has promised. And we believe after the cross in what God in Christ has accomplished on our behalf. And we believe his message and we trust his word. Okay. Cain's vegetable offering did not please God. Even blood sacrifices, if not brought in faith, were not acceptable to God. We see in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 11, Isaiah writes, What are all your sacrifices to me, asks the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings and rams and the fat of well-fed cattle. I have no desire for the blood of bulls and goats and lambs, all male goats. I have no desire for your sacrifices, in other words. Why, why was that true? Well, because if you don't bring a sacrifice, even the right sacrifice, by faith, what God has promised, if you're just doing it as ritual, that's not acceptable to God either. Okay? Uh, in Hebrews uh, chapter 1, excuse me, chapter 11, verse 4, it reads, By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith he was approved, he was approved as a righteous man, because God approved his gift. And even though he is dead, he still speaks through his faith. In other words, he serves as an example for what it is to offer a sacrifice by faith, to believe in God by faith. But more than that, his offering, that blood offering, was a picture of the offering that God would make when he would bring his son, Jesus Christ, as the Lamb of God to take away the sins of this world for all who believe. Jesus was the Passover lamb. In actual, Exodus chapter 12, verses 5 and 6, Moses writes, you must have an unblemished animal, a year old male. You may take it from either the sheep or the goats. You are to keep it until the 14th day of the month, of this month. Then the whole assembly of Israel, the community of Israel, will slaughter the animals at twilight. Now, they had to put the blood on the doorposts and the mantles. They had to eat all the sacrifice, okay, every bit of it, okay. And, and they had to make sure uh, that it was totally consumed or consume it. Uh, why? Because it was signifying, much like we do when we take communion today, our faith and trust in what God has provided for us, those who look to him and his salvation by faith, okay. So the lamb signified the innocent dying for the guilty. Jesus died for the guilty. A male lamb for the first year in the prime of life without spot or blemish, okay? Uh, uh, Christ was up without sin. He, this lamb was a picture of Christ. He was up without sin. He had no blemishes, okay? He slew the lamb, that is the one making the offering, slew the lamb, shed its blood, and roasted it with fire. Christ suffered and shed his blood for our sins. And his was an offering confessing his sins, that is the person in Israel that was offering a sacrifice, okay? Or Abel specifically was offering a sacrifice because he knew his sins. Uh, he, he was convicted by them. He knew he needed a savior. That's the work of God. Our sins deserve the wrath of God. And in order to justify us, the Lord Jesus must die before the justice of God. Okay? Let's turn to Romans chapter 3, verses 20, 23 and 26. Turn there. I'll pause a minute for a little sip of water as you turn your pages. Okay, Romans chapter 3, verses 23, all the way up to 26. Romans chapter 3, beginning of verse, chapter 3, beginning of verse 23. Paul writes, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace 
through the redemption that it is in Christ alone. God presented him as the mercy seat by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed ever since Adam. I, I add to that. God presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so that he would be just and the justifier and justify the ones who have faith in Christ Jesus. Okay. Christ is our substitute. He is our substitute. He made full satisfaction before the law of God, before the righteousness of God and the justice of God, enabling God. He enabled God to be just and the justifier of those who believe in Christ. The penalty for our sin, Christ took upon himself so that we may go free. Okay. Now let's move up to Genesis uh, verses 6, 7, and 8. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you furious? And why do you look despondent? If you do what is right, won't you be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. His desire is for you. I don't know who he's talking about there. His desire is for you, sin's desire. But you must rule over it. You must rule it. Cain's, uh, Cain said to his brother Abel, this is after God just told him what he told him. Abel, let's go out into the field. And while they're in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Well, Man's religion of works brings no true comfort and no communion with God. People who go about their ceremonies but find no peace. Uh, they make professions and act religious, but they find no rest or assurance because God is not reconciled. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 19, Paul writes, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. He has committed the message of reconciliation to us. So we have a very important uh, task that God has entrusted in the dark here. That is to preach that salvation is by grace alone, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, to put our faith in what he's accomplished for poor and needy sinners such of our, as ourselves. We who have come to Christ are entrusted <clears throat> with this message, this message of not just a hope, but a message of a sure hope. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, Cain was angry with God and he was angry with his brother who believed God. Instead of simply placing his faith in God, he dived deeper into sin. Okay. He rose up against his brother and killed him. Wicked people have been killing good people for since Adam and Eve left the garden, just about. Okay, The first human blood shed on earth was over how to be saved. That's right. The first human blood that was ever shed was over how to be saved. Okay, Cain chose works, his works, that he thought would be acceptable in God's sight or whoever, okay? But the Holy Spirit tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, and I'm going to jump to verse 10. You are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift. Now, when you pay uh, somebody because they've given you a gift, well, that's not a gift anymore. A gift is free, outright free. Uh, there's nothing to pay back. You know, there's no pay it forward. There's no pay it backward. Pay it to the left and pay it to the right. When God gives you a gift, it is a gift. Don't try to, to say, okay, God, you did this, and I'm going to do this for you. People actually make uh, bargains with God, so they think like that. Okay? In verse 10, he says, we are his workmanship. That is his saints. 
They are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Wow. Now, this battle between the Abels and the Cains, okay, uh, rages on and the results are the same. God is the same. Sin is the same. Men are the same. Women are the same. Children are the same. Put two young toddlers together in a playpen. Uh, if you don't go back and check up on them, or you better watch them, actually, they're going to kill each other. Mayhem is going to break out for sure. Even with infants, it's that fallen nature. Anyway, the way of life through the blood of Christ is the same. And the way of Cain still persecutes the way of faith. Okay. If you turn to Second Chronicles chapter 24, getting close, we're winding this up. Second Chronicles chapter 24, putting it at verse 20. There's a prophet named Zechariah who lived in a very troubling time and a time when he would bring the word of God prophetically to the, the rulers and they didn't like what he was telling them or what God was telling them, okay? It says, the spirit of God enveloped Zechariah, son of Jehoda, the priest. He stood above the people and said to them, this is what God says. Why are you transgressing the Lord's command so that you do not prosper? Sounds like echoes of uh, what God said to Cain. Okay, He says, why are you transgressing the Lord's command so that you do not prosper? Because you have abandoned the Lord. He has abandoned you. But they conspired against Zechariah and stoned him at the king's command in the courtyard of the Lord's temple. King Joash didn't remember the kindness that Zechariah's father, Jehoda, Jehodiah, uh, had extended to him, but killed his son. While he was dying, he said, may the Lord see and demand an account. Wow. Wow. God will exact a payment for their sin for killing him. Psalm 51 a very uh, well-known psalm of David's repentance, so he's signifying it in part. Psalm 51, putting it at verse 14. David writes, save me from the guilt of bloodshed. Why is he saying this? Because he has shed innocent blood. He has shed the blood of Uriah. He's a murderer. He coveted Uriah's wife. He says, save me from the guilt of bloodshed, God, God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Here it comes. You do not want sacrifice, or I would give it. You are not pleased with the burnt offering. Now stop there for a moment. Why is he saying this? Well, because under the law of Israel, if you coveted, someone's wife, you took the man's wife and you took this property, whatever it was, you murdered, there was no offering for that sin. The only thing that could happen to you was that you would be stoned, you would be killed, you would be executed because you were a murderer and a thief, okay, an adulterer. So David knows there's no sacrifice for him. He says, if you do not want to sacrifice, you do not want to sacrifice, or else I give it. You are not pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. And David is broken. Okay. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart, God. In your good pleasure, cause Zion to prosper, the city of God. Build the walls of Jerusalem. That is, if you go to Revelation, that's the saints. Okay. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings, then bulls will be offered on your altar. The best sacrifices offered today are the sacrifices born out of love. If you do a little study on sacrifices and incense and subjects like that, the ones that are truly acceptable to God by the saints in the New Covenant era, 
uh, more often than not, you'll read that they are what you do as far as good works towards one another for the praise and glory of God. Well, I hope and pray this, this lesson for you uh, has been profitable to you. It will be, I hope and pray, if you think about it more. And I, I trust that you will uh, join us again next time when we look at once again to gospel, the gospel in, uh, in Genesis. And I just pray that you would uh, read Genesis between now and then. Let's borrow it some prayer. Father in heaven, we just thank you for your word. We just thank you, Father, that you still speak to us through your word. We pray that your Holy Spirit and do indeed um, just refresh our hearts with the glory of the gospel in Christ Jesus. Help us to see and understand that the way of self-salvation, the way of works, is useless. It's vain. And Father, may we fully trust in the free gift that you have given us in Christ Jesus, your Son. We ask these things, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Would one of you brothers please close in prayer? Thank you very much. God bless.